he just had the zoom maze like 15 seconds ago so i'm like is he gonna just like jump on the couch and jump on this table he's been jumping on these tables a lot recently i'm telling you this cat knows when you're recording because every time you, we start recording he's like all right leave I'm- that ma- majestic creature alone case <laughs> is more entertaining than any of us could ever hope to be in our lives so Honestly. Uh, the jealousy is reading here uh-huh. Say it's an orange cat. I will. I'm, I'm jealous of that bitch. She sits around mm-hmm. and eats plants all day. And on Literally. that note, hi y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to a, a special surprise episode of Baby Daddies. I know you're like, oh my god, the season's over. What the fuck are they going to talk about? We have Daddy TV co-founder, creative director, playwright screenwriter copywriter correct these these are titles <laughs> those, those are all true things <laughs> silver kuzumano is here how you doing silver hi um i've not had i've not been called a playwright in like a lot of years so that was the one that got me like oh what? <laughs> I, I did some research today i did, I did a little bit <laughs> I see that. i'm sure you read some like mediocre to bad reviews of my previous work so thank you Everything seemed decent, you know. I was, written, you know, put some articles here, some LinkedIn <laughs> stuff here. Say, so what can I, what can I fucking find out? <laughs> Mario, how are you doing today? I'm doing great today. It is a little overcast, but you know what? We're bright and sunny in here. That's what matters. Oh wow, wow! That makes mm-hmm. at least one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like waiting for that coffee to like seep in. Then I'll be good. <laughs> I so Russian, so it must be nice to Mario. Oh, wow! Who <laughs> said I don't have issues? Wow. <laughs> okay, well, now you're censoring yourself in my trauma. That's how I feel. No, I'm kidding. I've been, <laughs> now, how, I've been watching a lot of that. Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> so, Topher, we wanted to bring you on to talk about for the love of Dills, talk about Daddy TV, talk about. Uh, some topics, some questions, some things that we wanted to cover. And I've really given an overview of the show because we've been loving it. The people have been loving it. And we wanted to you know, take a peek behind the curtain if we could. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's really exciting. And right before we started recording, I thanked both of you for all the work you put into this because I just think it's awesome that sort of the fans are communing about the show and people are picking apart the work and being really interested and kind of wanting to know the nitty gritty and really following the storylines. This stuff takes a lot of work and you do kind of always worry like no one's gonna like no one's gonna give a shit. Like no one what if no one cares that Dr. Dilf is actually, you know, the knight, right? Like what if no one cares? So the fact that like you guys care and like other people are listening to you and also caring, it means a lot. It really does. I yeah we watched mm-hmm. season one. Amario like brought this show to me out of nowhere. It was like we have to watch mm-hmm. this. Amario is like I think the person that loves reality TV more than anybody I know. So when he brought this show up, <laughs> it was like we have to binge this. I was like okay sure. So we watched season one, and while watching, I was like we need to have a recap show for season two. And so I was so happy to be able to do this. I had so much fun doing this. Um, it's been such a joy. So thank you for making such good TV. <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. I can't wait to see season five All Stars. Like it's gonna be okay. amazing. Ahead <laughs> <laughs> of yourself, bro. girl. <laughs> um, before you two spend the rest of the time being nosy, because uh, I also noticed you two are nosy. Oh, uh, which I love. Um, I have a quick question that I've been curious about as I've listened to the episodes. Do you two have some kind of background in like production or film? Because there are times when you two will be like, oh, well, that's the craft service table. Or, oh, sometimes they need to hold (laughs) to reset the camera and you couldn't get that shot from that (laughs) angle. (laughs) You're on sticks or handheld. And so like, where where is that coming from? Because you guys seem like more... um, more active, engaged participants than just normal viewers. I, uh, yeah, I went to school for media production. I went to Temple University for that. So, yeah, that's, that's how I have my my own little, you know, peeks into it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Sometimes I was listening to episodes, I was like, they know too much. Like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I am just a huge consumer of reality TV. Like, I started my reality tv show watching in high school when i was stumbled 
I was uh, late night, stumbled across an episode of Drag Race, and then I flipped the next channel, Slaver of Love, and I was like, oh my God, New York, this goddess. And I've just been watching reality TV since like 2011, like 11th grade. And now I've recently gotten into Housewives. I've watched uh, seasons and seasons of Housewives. So I'm just like, you know what? I know where this camera person is. I know what this person's going to do. I know this leads into this storyline. She's just, cracked the code. She's. I, I can't get enough of it. It's so <laughs> addicting. Listen, my business partner and I both always say, and, and Daddy TV is run by another really, really smart filmmaker um, who who does everything kind of alongside me. He does more of the production side. I do more of the, the creative side. But we always talk about like no one teaches reality TV production. Like no one teaches the craft of it. No one teaches how the storylines are built or what makes a good kind of unscripted narrative story. Um, and we always say that like the best producers in this field are just the fans. Like it is just the people who have wanted to watch every obscure random reality show who then says like, oh, I get it now. Like I've seen enough of this that I get it and I think I could make them. So I feel that that's how that's how we started. That's how Daddy TV got off the ground. Great. Well, that's actually the first thing I had on was let's talk about Daddy mm-hmm. TV. What, how, how did we start here? How did we find what what made y'all want to come together and start Daddy TV together? Yeah, so Daddy TV um, in its first form was Daddy Couture, which was a queer apparel company. Okay. Um, and, and that was founded by Rebecca Moore and Matthew Camp. And my partner, Artie, was sort of the, the mastermind behind Daddy Couture. And they started it before I kind of entered the picture. I was a stand-up comedian and a playwright, like you mentioned. And I got an MFA thinking that I wanted to teach. And I was kind of on my own journey of, of writing queer stuff and writing about sex and writing about intimacy. Um while also sort of engaging in sex work and hanging out with sex workers and thinking a lot about sex and labor um, in like a really academic, bo- like not boring, but like I was, you know, I thought I was going to be like a playwright, right? Or like a professor who wrote about other people's plays about sex and labor and feminism. And uh, obviously that I found out that like that doesn't pay very much, if anything. Uh, and I said, oh, um, because <laughs> one thing they teach you uh, when when you start being a whore is if it doesn't pay well, the gig's probably not worth it. And that's what I learned about academia when I was like, oh, I've been like doing sex work for a long enough time that I'm I'm now realizing this gig does not pay well. Um, and if my whole thing was thinking about sex and labor, I said uh, deuces. Uh, so while that was going on with me. Artie and Rebecca Moore, the the famous British porn star, and and Matthew Camp, the other famous porn star, they were making these cool, you know, queer apparel pieces. Um, I started writing T-shirts for them at one point and, like, marketing stuff. Um, And then Slag Wars happened, and we made a show called Slag Wars. Um, We got money from men.com. And we we made a reality show about sex workers we made a we we made a show about slags and it kind of changed everything um that led into hot house which led into Mm -hmm. iconic justice which led into our show fucking smart and so on and so forth until finally you got to for the love of dilfs um i will say like daddy tv was founded because so much of mainstream reality does not hire people with only fans uh, accounts they don't hire people certainly from the studio porn world unless there is sort of some trauma lens through it or some sort of um explanatory lens right like yeah. eighteen TV never wanted to explain queerness to straight people like we make shows for queer people and that's kind of what the brand has always been right like even the idea of like what a himbo is, right? Or what a DILF was in this context, right? We had to kind of trust that people would either know because they were queer or if straight people wanted to watch, they would like find a queer person and ask or Google it. Yeah, like what what, what is Mm -hmm. this? (laughs) Yeah, we still put like, like there's like fisting jokes in For the Love of DILFs. I mean, we get write-ups in People Magazine, but we're not really trying to water down the the lens of the show right and that is like 
a queer, self-aware, progressive, silly crew. That's what I love. I love it's like it's a like gay gay. You know what I it's mean? It's very gay. It is gay gay, and it's unabashed of that. Uh, really quick, I want to touch on Hot House and X-rated and all of these shows that focus on sex workers, people who are in the industry, queer people, the importance of sex positivity in media and specifically in queer media, because I feel like a lot, not just reality TV, a lot of TV will, like you said, only show us uh, in an explanatory way or uh, on a a cop procedural, you know, (laughs) I'm sure mm-hmm. the amount of uh, roles that Willem has had playing a sex worker on like 911 and oh. <laughs> you know all the medical shows and things like that. Like this is the only time that we see uh, queer sex workers and queer people. It's so I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have sex positivity in media like this. But I want to know what was the importance uh, doing things like this for reality specifically yeah. outside of a you know scripted. You know, I think the thing about reality TV is it has always been a safe space for queer people, right? Like queer people have always championed reality TV and have always really pushed it into the mainstream, but also pushed this idea of finding the authenticity within the camp and within the absurdity of it, right? Especially if you're thinking about like the golden age of reality, if you are thinking about like the flavor of love period, right? The tequila tequilas of the world. Those shows were kind mm-hmm. of surface and like offensive and weird in some ways, right? Um, but there was heart in in these cast members. There was a, so much vibrance and personality um, without them even having to try. And I think that what queer people do is kind of champion these underdog celebrities and make them icons. It's like part of our cultural role. Um, So combining that with, like I said, this lens of joy, right? Like Hot House specifically was about commute. I mean, you know, self-aware through the, with a lot of self-awareness, it's a show about community uh, for better or worse. And it's silly and it's like happy Um, And no one goes home, right? Um, And X-Rated is the same thing. I think what's fun about X-Rated NYC, our docuseries, is once again, like the self-awareness, right? Like we're reality TV fans. So we always, we're always kind of in on the joke of everything, Um, especially in those Mm -hmm. docu shows, right? Where there's, it's not a competition. Um, Not that they're not real people, but like, you know, Boomer, Banks, and Dante Cole know that what kind of show we're making and they kind of love it. Um, But it's also interesting because we never really show them on set. So you will never see, you know, Boomer Banks or Max Connor or Dante Cole or Joey Mills, like on specifically like on a porn set, like X-rated NYC is designed to be the opposite of how you would envision that show going down. Um, Mostly you see porn stars, in the context of their work in these kind of like behind the scenes docu-series and it always has to remain flirty and it always has to remain like deeply intimate and I think the fun of X-Rated NYC is it kind of shows this very real aspect of sex work which is like eh, like not all porn stars are sleeping together and in fact it's more like hey sis right like it's more (laughs) I can tell you (laughs) more sisterly a lot of times than it is like oh, we're all, like, dating and fucking, like, no, we're co-workers who, like, have messy, dramatic, silly yeah. relationships. It's a little more clerical. <laughs> it's a lot less uh, <laughs> yeah. orgies. Now, for the love of Dilf, I think I've the never- number one question that I have gotten from people is regarding, for lack of a better, it's kind of a loose term, the himbo and daddy dichotomy, right? Uh-huh. It's a, it's a little loose because <laughs> because at its core a himbo is what like somebody who is supposed to be nice kind of dumb and and hot right it's like a, a male and supports himbo. women something yeah and only- we we stretch a little bit people are always like but that's not a himbo and I'm like suspend the disbelief was there ever a time where it was two other things to demark or was it always going to be himbo daddy. No, I mean, what what is fun about those words for me is this conversation. Um, b- 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 what I what I love about Twitter and a lot of Twitter responses to the show, um, especially on season one, was like, when are you going to get real daddies? 
Uh, so then, like, out of spite, we put, like, a, like, a real dad on the show. Uh, but <laughs> they're made up, like, they're made up words. Yes. Like, they're kind of, like, they are self-identifiers. And what I like about the idea of himbo and daddy is it is more of a vibe than it is anything else. I think even in real life, right, people, yeah, like, the show is about age gap relationships. It is about intergenerational dating inherently. That's where a lot of the fun comes into the show. Um, but outside of that, like, I think a himbo is, like, fun and like vibrant and i think a daddy is a little bit more set in his ways a little bit more put together maybe um i don't know the show has defined itself over the seasons and we've we wrapped on season three already and i think it's still settling right but i will say like after Mm -hmm. season three i think this show really knows what the cast wants to be And I do think it's about, like, a vibe, right? It's about, like, daddies are caretakers and daddies are emotionally settled, right? And then the fun of the show is seeing that dust get kicked up for them, right? So, like, how does dating a younger person kick up some of these old wounds, these old traumas, right? If you think about Dr. Ed... How often in a real relationship is he going to get called out for being controlling, right? Like, how often is that actually going to happen unless you're dating a younger person on a reality show who's actually looking at you through this very specific lens saying, like, oh, that could be a red flag. Let's have that conversation. Um, I think the same thing about Anthony, right? Like, in a normal dating Mm -hmm. situation, someone like Anthony could get up and just go for a run whenever he wants to. I'm not making a judgment on like anyone's intimacy style, but I will say what's interesting in this context is like, well, what happens if you can't like, what happens if you actually just have to have the conversation and not lean back on these sometimes decades old safeties and defense mechanisms. Right. Um, I think on season two, the most interesting case of that was Jimmy. Like, what happens if you just have to open your mouth? If you can't be just, uh, you know, conflict avoidant through this entire experience? Like, what happens if you just Mm -hmm. don't have the opportunity to do that? Um, So, yeah, that's what I like about the daddy thing being so loose is like, you know, as long as we feel like they're emotionally settled in some way, um, you could be a daddy, in my opinion. I mean, I tell Amari all the time, daddy's a, daddy's a mindset, you know? You have is, said it, that. I have said it multiple times. <laughs> Daddy is a mindset. And I, I agree. I think it was really interesting with both Dr. Ed and Anthony. Anthony for the fact that uh, the experience helped him, you know, open up and be more vulnerable. And, and like you said, like, yeah, you can't go on a run all the time. You have to stay there. And I feel like a lot of people, if faced with some of these situations, mm-hmm. would just take the... Uh, just just walk away kind of route, you know, mm-hmm. They're, you know, it's not worth my time. I'm not going to put the effort in. But when you're stuck in that and have to actually work through it, I think that does. I mean, it makes for good TV. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also really love that you said that being a daddy or being a himbo is a vibe because like I've been called both, which is crazy to get called daddy. I'm like, I'm five, four, 130 pounds. Like I am so small, but like I'll tell my friends, oh, I did my homework. I did my taxes. And they're like, oh, wow, you're such a daddy. You have it all put together. And I was like, <laughs> you take care of the okay, cat. girl. You I are take a care daddy the- now. <laughs> I am, you know, I'm a father, Um, you know? Yeah. No. And I think that we always want to stretch what that means on the on the seasons right like showing someone like dr ed and someone like nigel personality wise both cast in the light of daddy it does lead to these really cool textured questions about like oh you could be a femme emotional daddy right like Mm, hell yeah he's an emotion like i find nigel to be like an emotional (laughs) leader i find him to be really empathetic and caring i do think that that's like a daddy quality in its own way so you know, it's fun to pick apart it because they're made up words. Exactly. Right? Like, everyone mm-hmm. listen. Please stop tweeting that like you just have to be old or have kids. Like go watch another show. It's <laughs> fucking annoying. Shut up. Yeah, because I've definitely had to like tell people, let's just uh not ignore the definitions of the words, but like just understand these are just 
the groupings for two types of people. And that's like, they don't have to fit the definition 100%. And I will say mm -hmm. to everyone who likes to bitch and moan, there, are, <laughs> there is like, even if you don't want to parse apart, like the cultural reference of what a himbo or a daddy is to queer people, the daddies are always older and the himbos are always younger. Like at, at its core, again, like they're always intergenerational in some way. So, you know, if you get confused, just lean back on that. Yeah. If, if you see a, a sliver of gray, it's probably a daddy. It's probably <laughs> a daddy. You know, I mean, let me not actually, let me retract that statement. A lot of, a lot of the men in my family started graying at the age of 21. It sadly missed me. I was begging for that gene. <laughs> I was begging for gray hair. I could have been salt and pepper by now. It could have been so nice. Did you want to do a rogue <laughs> cosplay? Um, I am at the end of the month. C2E2 oh, yeah. is coming to Chicago. I got my rogue uh, outfit in my closet. Wow. Am I psychic? Can I'm I'm psychic. I think, I think you might be. I think you can like you can like mm -hmm. sense it somewhere in there. <laughs> in the back for those of you watching the video in the background, uh censored the drink that Topher is drinking right now. Uh let's talk Stormy Daniels. How does Stormy come into the project? We were looking for the, per I mean, the perfect host. That's the thing. It was like, this was such a weird show to develop. Um, Cause just like you, we had to ask ourselves like, well, what, what is it daddy? What is it? Are we looking for like really old guys? Are we looking for like really like 18 to 21, right? Like what does this show look like? Um, and I'm, I'm glad where we settled there cast wise. And then going back to this layer of self-awareness and this layer of kind of camp and fun, who better than Stormy Daniels, right? Um, and we were always really aware that it was kind of a, you know, it's a little random, but then also, like, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, on season one, her cold open script says something like, you know, I know it's weird I'm hosting this show, but the check cleared, and I but love the it. check cleared. <laughs> yeah, like, that was kind of always the daddy TV mantra, too. Like, how do we center sex workers in like a different light and i think the idea of stormy daniels one of the most iconic porn stars in the entire world um and yeah like this stuff with trump and sort of the cultural figure of it all like that's cool but i also just think it's like really cool that a really famous porn star is also like a mainstream reality to like oh yeah she's never naked she like right like it is it's fun and it's sexy and like obviously like we play into it, but Stormy is just a great host and a great comedian. It just it all kind of aligns. Yeah, she her her uh, physical comedy, her the way she delivers lines as well. Like she she you knows love how her to take it and run with moments. it. I love a Stormy acting moment. I want that's actually probably <laughs> the next the next thing that I wanted to get into was the the tiny little acting moments that she gives us at the end of every episode. <laughs> Doctor Dill calls, yeah, yeah, love. the Doctor Dill calls, what like. Where did the idea from those come? I love every single one of them. <laughs> Thank you. I, so going back to me being, I, like, I trained as a playwright, and then I did stand-up, and then I was a comedy writer for a long time. And if you guys watched Hot House, we have the Hot House narrate. Mm -hmm. um, the actual I mean, house itself. The actual house itself is the narrator, like the Disney made-for-TV movie, Smart House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I think on this show, we didn't want to lose some of that, like those scripted genes. This show is 100% organic, right? Like we, no one tells them how to date, how to pick all the eliminations. They vote how they vote. Um, but what makes daddy TV, daddy TV is like, how do you take something that's so organic and raw and you have like Nigel hysterically crying and then smash that up against what is clearly like a scripted SNL skit almost, like these random <laughs> little scripted moments. Um, so that was sort of the impetus. Um, when we were first writing the show, we also thought that that is where you would meet the single for the next episode mm -hmm. so that she would be on the phone. Mm -hmm. She'd be like, Dr. Tilf, and like she would do the whole thing about the episode and she'd be like, yes, they're here, like on Fantasy Island, and you would yeah. turn and see them like walking down the path but then it's like it kind of spoiled seeing like it gave too much in that last moment so we moved that to the front we just kept them as funny little skits 
Nice. I love him. I, mm. I especially like the the one with Matt where he take where he takes her oh, phone. <laughs> that that was great. That, that was, was a good spur of the moment, mostly because we loved Matt. Um, and you know what? You know, one day in, one day out. Not that we were rooting for um for a Nigel Rico breakup at all. Uh, obviously, based on how the season turned out. Um, but he was so excited to be there. He was such a good sport about being voted out. He really was like, he was laughing and being playful and his banter with Stormy was really charming. So I'm glad that we, uh, we just improv that one and, oh, and nice. had fun with it. He did so nice. Well, I said it last time. I was like, did we say we said Matt for season four? <laughs> we did say Matt for season four. Man. Can I just say that people want to sleep with Matt so badly? And not that I'm surprised, but like the response to Matt has been very uh, direct and swift. <laughs> direct. Uh, people want some lawyer cock. People want that pro bono boner. Oh they God, want I forgot it. he's a lawyer. Mm-hmm. I fully focus on the comedian part. I know everyone thinks he's like a birthday clown. No, the man is a lawyer. Oh God, I forgot about that. Lawyer. Oh my god! Well, well, I don't know, Jake. I kept thinking he was a pediatrician because you kept. Well, you're right because because he looks like my childhood pediatrician, Doctor Sholnick. <laughs> <laughs> Not Doctor Sholnick getting a shout out on the pod. Yeah, shout out Doctor Sholnick. Keep me healthy as a kid. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so much about you too. I know. <laughs> if he ever comes across this, he's gonna be like, "What is going on here?" I don't even know if he's alive. <laughs> He's going to think I should have aborted that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, how they grow. Uh, I wanted to, uh, before we started recording, you had mentioned uh, someone being poly. And that's something else that I get asked about a lot in, in terms of the show. They're like, well, the show seems so monogamous based. And I, I don't know, has the show ever, has there been any moments where people were considering doing open things or how would the show handle people being poly? Yeah, that's a good question. I will say like, it's not a show about polyamory. I think that exactly more to unpack in that conversation, to be honest. Um, I don't think, you know, I will say we've had couples say on the show that they had open relationships. So I think we Mm -hmm. have tackled it in the way that, it's about finding the couple who is most committed, right? That does not mean monogamous on this show. Um, I will also say, like, I don't know that Nigel Nigel and Rico are still together. I don't know, but, like, I don't know that they're monogamous. I don't know that any of the couples who are still dating are monogamous. Most of my gay male friends who are in committed relationships are not monogamous. Well, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Whether that means they're playing together, whether that means you have a bestie who you get blowjobs from, whether that means Mm -hmm. you're full poly and you have multiple partners. I don't think we shy away from that on the show, but I think the focus of the characters is about building that committed. Like, this is not the person you just want to fuck for the rest of your life. We're saying, like, who do you want to play video games with? Who do you want to make up next to? Who do you want to share a bank account with? In my experience of gay men, that does not mean the person that you're going to only sleep with for the rest yeah. of your life. Although some people come onto the show and say very clearly, I am monogamous. You may not sleep with other people. I will be jealous and upset. Um, others have come on and been like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, you know, Bobby yeah. and Nate, I think, had a whole scene about being open. Like, I don't think. I think so. I think in season mm-hmm. one, during the compatibility test. Yeah. More people were open to being open than in season two. I remember season, maybe it's just fresh in my mind, but in, in this past season, I feel like only a handful, maybe like two or three people actually said like yes the green to flag. That part, the green flag mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. I mean, again, sometimes it's just a matter of preference. Um, I will say, I hope people don't presume it is the the stance of the show that to win, you should only be like, that is not the... That is not part of the judging rubric that they're yeah, ever. Yeah, no, that's that's not mm-hmm. the people haven't been saying that, but people but have the more what so if been, of it. Yeah, like what? Yeah, I don't know how we would. I mean, no one's ever come to us and said we want to have a triad and then still get voted the winners. And I Ooh. think like, 
mathematically that way like i'm mm. so bad at math you guys like that would probably give me a panic attack because i'd be like okay so now I have three people that leaves me x amount of votes and you need this many <laughs> like that stresses me out so <laughs> a, po- no a polycule but they just vote two people out of the polycule to be the the winners <laughs> <laughs> now that's that my would be tv yeah. what if both cup okay but wait so what if both the top two couples, when Stormy's like, and the winner is, they're like, hold everything. And then it's a four way kiss, and they're mm-hmm. all together, and, and they split the money. And then everybody stood and everybody clapped. Yeah, break the crown. And we were gagged at home. And you get a piece, and you get a piece. <laughs> all those Stormy Bucks. Oh my God, I still have my Stormy Bucks right here. Listen, Did you guys get Stormy Bucks. Like what is happening? Sorry, but. How are the cops being smuggled? I I am upping security, security immediately. You no, know, let's, I'm let's just say we have a contact. Are you stalking we, us? Like we have an inside set? contact. Let's say that. <laughs> I mean, you guys. I'm not going to say anything, but when you see a picture of me and the dolphin, you know. Yeah, the the CGI dolphin. Gloria, that damn dolphin. She's nosy. <laughs> Wait, did you say she has a name? Wait, yeah. Astoria was that the name? I, I didn't miss Gloria, it. Gloria, oh, Gloria, Gloria, Gloria. Okay, I thought her name was Astoria. I was like, Ooh, I thought you said Astoria. She's Brooklyn. <laughs> She's <laughs> Queens. <laughs> oh god. Um. Oh, Gloria, that's so cute. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> I love the like the dill floor. This is exactly what I wanted I from today. See, this is what I would. This is really what this is about. Is the peaks behind the curtain? Like, why Gloria? You know what? what is she, <laughs> What's her narrative? Where is she going to narrate? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever said this on any podcast before. My my partner and I already love running jokes. And some of them are like so long running. They're not even jokes anymore. They're just like role playing characters that mm-hmm. live in our lives. So Glory is our fake personal assistant. Oh. So like if he sends, he's, if he'll be like, uh, like, I'll be like, hey, can you, like, send me those edits? And he'll be like, please ask Gloria. And I'll be like, hi, Gloria. Good afternoon. Will you please ask Mr. <laughs> Davis if he has those edits prepared? And sometimes on the phone, if I do that, he'll be like, hello, and do Gloria's voice. So we name we name uh, things after her sometimes, like the dolphin. Shout out to her. Right? Something else that people have asked me about is... The casting process, and I don't know what people are asking me necessarily, but like, because some people, I think, as people watch both the show and and the recaps, there's more people who have like, I had someone come up to me at the bar the other day, where they were like, "What's the show about? How do I get on it? This looks fun." And I was like, "Girl, don't ask me. I'm not. I'm not involved with them. <laughs> like, do some research." So for the people to quell it, what's the casting process like? Because the girls are eager. Yeah. So if you follow at daddy tv or at out tv um will always post the casting notices you have to send in a video I saw. um they go to the network first so just so people like so daddy tv the, the company i co-own we're just the production company mm-hmm. um and then out tv is the the network um so all the audition tapes go to the network first um so please, like, you don't have to DM me dick pics or try to sputter up. Your, like, I get no first say in anything. <laughs> but no, uh, it's it's a one minute or a one to two minute video where you have to explain why you're a daddy or a himbo. Like, what what's your definition of that term? Um, why you're into the other, right? So I'm a daddy because X, Y, and Z. I'm into himbos because of X, Y, and Z. And then why you feel like you're ready for a real relationship. So a little bit about your life. like, And I'm looking for a real relationship because I'm recently divorced and I think I have a great personality, right? Like whatever that is. Um, it really is that simple. Show us lots of personalities. Show us a lot of heart. Be really authentic, right? Like we can kind of smell bullshit from a mile away. Um, my biggest thing is we make a lot of shows in a year. We always, always, always want to see audition tapes from everyone, everyone. Um, I will say, if you're not into daddies, right, if you're not really into himbos, you're probably not going to do well on this show. Like, we do take that part seriously in the process. Like, on set, there is no one telling you who to pick. 
you will be judged by your peers. They will be able to tell if you're not into daddies or himbos. Mm -hmm. So faking it just to get on a popular show is probably not advised. And also other people have done that storyline probably better than you can. So don't try to recreate something. You hear that, Amario? Two minute video. I'm not. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I'm, I'm just I mean, <laughs> listen. I put the reel up on what was it Friday? The first thing was a Mario. Get on season four. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, telling say. <laughs> oh, speaking to piggyback off that question about casting, has there ever been? I, don't know if I should be okay to ask this. Has there ever been a moment where someone sent in an audition video and it's like, well, you may not be a fit for this show, but can we put you on this? Hmm. All the time. All oh, the time. okay. Yeah, that is. I mean, that is like a big. Just in in production in general, I think that's a thing that happens, right? You there's always people who are so talented, and you know sometimes it's a numbers game, right? Like we get so many audition tapes. Sometimes there's just too many good people for a season, and you have to hold on to some of them. And you know we send DMs to people all the time, being like, "Hey, we got your audition tape. Yeah, you didn't make it this time, but I swear to God, like, we really loved you. Like, please know that we really, really loved you. So if anyone listening ever got a DM from us like that, we meant that. That You know, there's lots of people in the roster who we would love to work with. Hear that? That's for all y'all. Keep sending, keep sending tapes. Keep yeah, sending them. Uh, next, uh, also in the casting process, I have noticed over the course of both seasons I always really appreciate the amount of uh, body diversity, diversity yeah. in types of people. That is something that sticks out to me compared to other reality shows, uh, other reality shows in general, but also specifically, I think reality shows that feature queer people. You know, a lot of them have just been cookie cutter muscle, muscle gaze. And I like that mm -hmm. when I turn this show on, I see people that I see in the real world. Yeah, thank you. So, so that is something that I am very, very, very proud of. Um, deeply, profoundly proud of, actually. One, centering older men in a position of sexuality, sensuality, attraction, I think is really healthy and important for queer men. I think that a lot of people still joke like, oh, God, gay death is 30. And it's like, no, look at Big Sal. Big Sal is so fuckable. Get out of my face. <laughs> Um, yeah, but also like personally as the person who makes th the show, right. Um, I'm a bear chaser. I need a juicy ass. I love a belly. I like hair. Um, and you know, sometimes as an artist, it's like create what you want to see in the world. And I want to see fat, hairy ass bouncing across my screen in slow-mo while descending from a pool as Stormy Daniel shakes her titties in the foreground. Hey, man. That's my I can dream. see the shot right now. Like, <laughs> that, that, that's my dream. But you did see the shot. It was Rico and Nigel all season. <laughs> 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 the shot was there. It was them on that boat. <laughs> um, but no, we've always loved juicy men and women on TV. If, even if you watch Hot House, honestly, I think Hot House could have veered into a place where it was like, well, only fans creators to be successful. You have to be really thin. And we net we always had plus size people on Hot House. Mm -hmm. Like big sex workers make a lot of money. Like fat people are hot, fat people are fuckable, fat people are desirable. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we need more of them on TV. So Hundred percent. Yeah, I just had to touch on that because I was like, and that I always really, and I, I talk about this when see when, when we first watched season. I was like, oh my god, these are like real people, which yeah, I mm -hmm. love that. I want to get into a couple iconic moments from season two and kind of get uh, what was going on behind the scenes. What was everyone thinking? Was everyone running around like a chicken with their head cut off? The first one, uh, the Pride dot com photo shoot. And the importance of that, because those photos, stunning. And uh, the article, so like, what went into getting that all set up? Was that always the plan? How did that come about? Um, Rachel from Pride.com uh, is fantastic. Um, like, just a really cool, interesting, um, big supporter of the show. Big reality TV fan. Um so for season two, I think this idea of later in the season, how could we bring in an outside person 
to judge, I mean, frankly, to judge for me, it was always about first impressions, right? You know, when you meet a couple just like at the bar and you're like, oh, that was such a fun couple. Like they're like a charming, cool, like I liked meeting that couple as a unit together, right? Mm -hmm. As a stranger, they had good vibes. That was kind of the impetus of like where we wanted to go with that challenge. And then when we thought like, who would we get to do that or judge that? Or what does that look like in a gamified comp, right? Like how do you make that a game or a challenge of some kind? Making it an interview made the most sense. And that's also why I'll say, because I think you guys mentioned it maybe on that episode recap. We intentionally do not judge the pictures mm-hmm. for that reason. Stormy yeah, says, Ke- not a that up. Yep. Yeah. And we do that. And yes, I mean, him and Jimmy looked very cute in their pictures. But what we tell Rachel to judge is chemistry as a couple, which you know, some of those himbos are influencers or literally runway, like Keese is a runway model. So I love Keese. I would work with him again and again and again. He's lovely. But like, yeah, no duh, bitch. You took a good picture. Like, that's not like, I love that he came on this podcast and was like, and our pictures would have won. Like, yeah, of course your pictures would have won. (laughs) Like, that's why we judge it on that. Um, (laughs) So... Yeah, no, I think Rachel is a good judge of character and she's a good judge of intimacy and love. So that's how that one came about. Nice. The DIY disaster. Was there ever a plan for them to actually do the DIY stuff? No. <laughs> okay, that's no. What I thought. <laughs> no. That's what I thought. No, no. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, to, oh okay, wait, wait, wait. So the DIY stuff. The DIY stuff, I thought we were going to do. I'll tell you exactly how that. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about it. (laughs) This is, I mean, I'll, uh, without breaking too much of kind of how the show is, you know, put together. How the sausage is made. We had Rico and Nigel going. And when we showed this, Rico and Nigel left the house. They had a whole date. So, like, Crew members obviously had to go just to get them there, right? Like, they had to go with a story producer. They had to go with, like, someone to make sure that they were just safely arriving and, like, getting on a fucking moving helicopter. So it was, like, a slightly smaller crew. And the reason it was written to be those, like, DIY dates was to be, like, oh, we're going to really, like, quietly and gently, because we knew it was going to be a big um, elimination, because it's our compatibility test, which is always, like, a big moment. Mm -hmm. You never know Mm -hmm. who's going to go home. So the thinking was, let's give them like a really simple, fun activity, like tie dye. And what I thought was going to happen was that we would see them kind of being like, hey, babe, I know that we might go home tonight, but I just really want you to know this experience has been. So when I was like piecing together the segments of that episode or the activities that they would optionally be able to do, I was thinking emotionally the cast would be more there. When I tell you that as that day progressed and as Nico and as Rico and Nigel were leaving, we kind of very quickly realized like, oh, the group has stuff that they might want to say to each other because Keese and Hazel were like, they had that. It's too slow. Well, they had a thing in the bedroom. I was like, I think the group is kind of bubbling over. Uh, So we let everybody play in the kitchen and then they had a group conversation. And then what happened happened. Yep. Yeah, it it definitely happened. (laughs) There was real in the reality TV. We wrote it, though, to be fair. Like, there were things in that box that they could have, like, (laughs) we were planning on actually tie-dyeing some underwear. Like, we were to do crafts, and that sometimes it just doesn't work out the way you think it's going to. I mean, that's that's reality TV. (laughs) And your art department says, why did I spend $50 on a tie-dye kit? And I say, I'm so sorry. So yeah. <laughs> are the boxes still available can it be like you know <laughs> my favorite dr dill joke that i ever wrote so i write all the dr dill voiceovers my favorite one i think i ever wrote is in that episode about that moment um i think it made it to the episode but i think jimmy says oh did dr dill send us a box of bees and dr dill just goes <laughs> A box of bees. Why did you think of that? That's hilarious. Um, and it really made me laugh to think Everybody that. Everybody gets cool. bees. <laughs> That's a good one. Next, the Anthony versus Hazel situation. Mm-hmm. What 
was uh, going on behind the scenes because a lot of this you know, happened during mic changes kind of off off scene Mm -hmm. from a producer standpoint. How are you like, shit, how do I get the people to understand this is what is happening here? So it's a great question. Um, We are really, I mean, you know, we're really good at knowing where things are happening and when, Um, and there's, you know, there's those cameras around the house. You see them like in the hallway and you see them in the bedroom. So Things don't typically get around us. I will say that. Like, it, there's no privacy on, on set. Like, it is like very- a bottle of Tito's in someone's drawer. Yep. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, no comment there. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I swear I'm not shady. I'm a nice girl. I will say. Uh, <laughs> no, with the, with the Anthony Hazel thing, I think it was about... They came up really early in a scene, um, fair like pretty quickly after the fact. Uh, they brought it up. Um, so part of it is about just like making sure that you have people telling the story enough, right? Like, because that's the thing. Like, if the story changes over the course of several scenes, it might not be true. Um, so like, you know, seeing how the story plays out between a few people. And that's why we show it play out on the show a couple different times with different people. Um, and we just let the audience weigh for themselves. If you hear all of the people involved tell the same story multiple times from their point of view, you know, if it's good enough for Hitchcock, it's certainly good enough for daddy TV. So we let people fill in their own blanks. Nice. Yeah. We definitely had a theory crafting moment. I guess on that, like as viewers, did you feel robbed somehow that you didn't get to phonetically piece together the exact interaction? Or did you walk away feeling like, well, everyone admitted it happened? Like, well, I mean, we're crazy people. So I think we'll we'll never be satisfied. (laughs) We're we're always like, we want to see more gameplay. We want to see more people whispering. We want to see more more espionage. We want to see all that. So we'll never be satisfied. We might not be the best people to ask. I will say this after watching it, I definitely, uh, well, of course I wanted to talk to the people involved to get everyone's story, but I also, uh, I said this on multiple episodes. I said two things can be true at the same time, you know, and that doesn't negate either of their experiences just because someone took it that way. doesn't mean that's how it was intended. That's how I've always come at that situation. So that's, yeah, I will say it, it was not planned this way. Obviously, if I could have captured that moment on film, oh, of course, uh, obviously, mm-hmm. I would have a heartbeat. I would have cut off a pinky to do it. What I do like about that situation, though, is that it mimics a real friend group. In that, if your man is swerving on your friend, <laughs> you will not see it happen. You will not get an instant replay. Your friend will come to you and say, I think this happened. You will go to your man and your man will say, well, here is actually what happened. And then if you're lucky, you will get them both in a room together where you can say what happened. So I think as a viewer of this show and thinking that this is a show about building relationships, the fact that an audience does have to live that moment through Daniel's eyes is powerful, right? Like you are experiencing as a viewer how the twins had to handle that. Um, and for me, I think that maybe that's like more emotionally impactful than getting to see everything happen. Oh, of course. I just want to be, um, I just want to be, you know, a fly on the wall in Dorf <laughs> Mansion. <laughs> or Josie, you both broke onto set and stole Stormy Bucks. The FBI <laughs> is on their way. Oh, oh. You're going to get. Plotted, I, swear. Well, I, I did say that I was going to snorkel my way to Dill's Mansion. <laughs> you did say that. This is like this is like misery. This is like I'm getting chills, you guys. I feel like I'm in an A24 movie. Like one of you is going to be like, and I'm in your house right now. It's, uh-huh. I'm it's Dr. Dill. <laughs> it's going to be like misery. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, when Amaro's going to get on season four, I'm going to sneak a tile onto his, uh, in, into his suitcase and then I'll snorkel mm-hmm. my way to Dove Mansion. <laughs> And I'm just going to sit next to Stormy Day. And my goal is to be her like flotsam, jetsam. I just want to sit there and make weird noises and, and <laughs> help her perfect. scheme. You're hired. 
<laughs> Perfect. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing that I wanted to touch on about season two specifically was the Nigel and Jimmy situation. And because uh, there were a lot of people in the room at that time, a lot of mm-hmm. things happening. What when what was everyone else thinking? Was it did everyone think it did anyone think it was gonna get more explosive? Because I know up top it felt like it could have turned into a, a full screaming match. And it didn't, but we're talking about the moment with all of the daddies and the yes, first the time daddies, in the daddies. The first time that in the daddy said when they're when they're confronting. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that was one of the first moments where Jimmy kind of had an opinion that was strong enough that he wanted to share it. I think for people like Jimmy in these situations, what's interesting is they don't want to just say anything and not be able to take it back, right? So they have to really know they mean something. Yeah. What's interesting is that, like, builds up over the course of several days. And I think at some point when you're building something up internally – what happens is you'll notice little things then, and those little things start building up into big things. So it's like, well, did you see the way they looked at each other? And did you see that, right? So instead of just saying, I have a really big problem with Rico saying, you had to vote for me and just keeping it there. It is easy over the course of a day or two to then go to, and you cry too much and you're toxic and I don't like the way you two smell, right? Like. So I think Jimmy had a great point. I think Jimmy delivered it as best he could in that moment through his own, you know, anxieties about being perceived, his own anxieties about playing this game. It's like a weird game to play where you you have to go against people, but then they have to vote for you. So there's all of that. Um, like you said, I think two things could be true at once. I think that, like, some of that was a very nuanced specific conversation also like at some point just a difference in like how people want to have relationship right like sometimes but like you you know sometimes you could be right but you also might be like inadvertently yucking someone's yum yes 100 percent. yeah i I mean like jimmy did say the best he could like you know should it be this hard all the time all the time I think and that's I the like, best way he could have said it. Jimmy said it uh, when he was on on, this, on our episode with him. He mentioned that because he, he, he felt the need to clarify. He was like, Daddy TV did not tell me to say anything. They waited until I felt enough to say something. I think that was more like <laughs> paraphrasing kind of what he said. But he was like, yeah, no, nobody told me to say anything. <laughs> I and I will oh, and I will say this in every interview I ever conduct about our shows. I do not get paid extra. For being conniving, I don't get paid extra if a certain person wins or loses. And when I tell you that at its core, Daddy TV is a bunch of like queer sex workers, we're we're like, we're not going to put in the extra effort to manipulate all these people. If there's like A, no benefit and B, it's like, what's the point? They they fight amongst themselves. Like, no, we never we never tell anyone to do anything. And there's a lot of other boring. You'll just get edited out. I do tell them that like, you know. If you don't have anything to say on an episode, we film for 10 hours a day. An episode is one hour. So you, I will gladly cut you out of an episode. Sure. <laughs> so pipe up. Pipe up. Uh-huh. Get cut. <laughs> yeah. If you want that check to clear, you better open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. And uh, was there anything that was like cut for time, but was super memorable? And you're like, damn, I wish we could have shown that. I was covered. I like that question. That's a great question. Let me think if there was anything that was cut for time. You know what? The yeah, there was. Um, there were really, really lovely, funny, good moments with the strippers. Oh, I didn't even forget to see my strippers. There was so much that episode. There was so much voting stuff happening there, and we did want to show. To your point, we. That was one episode where I think the gameplay was really informing the relationship. So we did want to show more of those tactical conversations than we typically might on other episodes that focus a lot on the romance, too. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that episode needed to be more weighed toward the games and the votes and the strategy of everyone. 
Uh, what we ended up losing, though, were these really sexy, charming dates where all of the couples got a chance to work the pole themselves. Kate, oh, this no! Because that's literally what I said that episode. I was like, I wish we could see them on the pole. <laughs> they did. Each of them took a turn on the pole. We have Kane doing his split. Um, that whole scene was really organic and lovely because in that one, like, they were just hanging out in the, like, the cameras were just rolling and they were hanging out in the living room and we had strippers and stormy bucks and they were playing <laughs> around and being hot. And I remember watching the the string out with the, you know, the full footage for the day. Um and knowing it was going to have, because we had so much juicy, good, like, there was just so much stuff that we had to show for any of it to make sense uh, that I knew a lot, if not all of it, was going to get chopped. And I remember watching and being like, oh, this is so cute. Like, it was just so cute. Um, so shout out to the cast. They had so much fun that night, and they really were really sexy on the poll. Damn, now... My fears are confirmed because I, I was like that. I was like, damn, I wish I got to see them on the pole. And now I know the cut is somewhere on a hard drive. And was, <laughs> what I want to speak to and not to make you feel terrible about it. What I thought was so cute is a lot of the daddies tried to like a lot of the daddies. Like it wasn't just the daddies being like, all right, himbo, twerk your ass for me. Like the daddies tried to be sexy for the himbos, too. And I love when daddies put an effort like that. I think it's really sweet. I love it. Yeah, in moments like that, and in the uh, the uh, BDSM rope challenge, like that, mm -hmm. the, not challenge, but that moment, I I was like, damn, I just I could like watch a full hour of just this, you know, oh, absolutely, like, just hearing them talk about kinks and exploring sexual fantasies and no. like that conversation of it all. I was like, I could watch a full hour of just this. Nigel did say he had like twenty seven kinks, so. We montaged it, but another funny thing that had to get montaged and like really like missed a lot of the fun of it was them actually doing the bondage class. It was like a full like, I don't know, 20 minute like instructional on how to do those knots and watching these fucking himbos getting like watching them try to do the knots, but equally like watching them like getting like mixed up as they were getting tied up was really <laughs> funny. Like I remember that being a thing that I was like, oh yeah, if we had, if it was like a two part episode, you could watch 10 minutes of just them getting tied up. It's like. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. That, that was a really, that was maybe one of my favorites uh, this season was getting to see the, the bondage class and, what happened thereafter of everyone talking about that kind of stuff. So yeah, I truly was like, this is great. I could watch all this. Mm -hmm. And my last question, we're swinging for the fences. This is a long shot. Is there anything you could share with the girls about season three? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, don't get is yourself in trouble, you know, I'm but I'm trying to think of like a really good, Teaser. Okay. 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 Um, there is shocking voice notes play a bigger role than anything Ooh. I've ever made before. Shocking voice notes. Shocking voice notes. The Nancy Drews are going to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, when you, I hope you will do another season of this for season three. And I oh, hope we are. Play oh, absolutely. This moment back when you watch episode one of season three and you will say we've unlocked what this could have meant. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait. I can't wait. And I, I can't wait to go back and rewatch season one and recap that with Amari. We're very excited to, to go back mm -hmm. and do a retrospective on that. My goodness. Yeah, but Topher, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us, shooting the shit, giving us some some insider knowledge on how the show is made and everything that goes into it. We are always so happy to watch anything from Daddy TV, really. Um, so yeah, we just, thank you so much. Please, um, and I say this with all my heart, I really do. Um, so believe me when I say it. Um, if I see you anywhere near one of my sets again, I'm fucking <laughs> And I'm not playing. Stay away. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Thank you so much for having me, guys. <laughs> She's an actress. I was over here leaning in, there like, are you gonna tell me you love me? Stay away from me. I was like, this, <laughs> this this is uh this is where he tells Amario that he's actually on season four. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this is <cool. laughs> 
Uh, you're so perfect. I love you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else who has worked on For the Love of Dilfs for making such great TV if you are seeing this. And uh, we appreciate you. And not just for making this show special, but making it stand out amongst other queer reality TV shows. A lot of other shows do like one or two seasons of like, you know, like, uh, what's the big one that I always talk about? Are you the one did like one queer season, Maybe right? The, a lot of times reality shows give us like, well, they're like, here's the gays one season. You're done. That's all you get. That's all. That's all y'all need. I appreciate that. This show is unabashedly queer stays queer is for queer people. You know, I, I love it. So thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching. I mean, we couldn't do it unless people were tuning in and being really engaged and wanting to do stuff like this. So I, again, I, I was joking before, but I really do appreciate this. It's always fun to listen to you guys. Thank you. Before we leave, do you want to promote anything? You guys can follow me at T-O-P-H-C-U-S. So that's Tof Koos. You can follow me on like Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, and then follow Daddy TV at Daddy TV. Um, and yeah, check out our other shows, please. Uh, For the Love of Dilfs is amazing. We have other shows, though, with lots more trans folks. We have shows with girls. We have a game show. We have a courtroom show with Willem. So yeah, dig into the to the Daddy TV canon. It means a lot to us. We, we put a lot of work into it. Man, and shout out to Willem for for liking one of our reels yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mario, where does the booty do the origami at? Well, Gloria and I are actually doing a collab. I will be twerking on her while she's swimming. And you can catch that at bootyorigami.twitter.com. Oh, that's not a bottlenose <laughs> dolphin. That's a booty nose dolphin. That's a <laughs> <laughs> you can follow me at Crow Kunk for all my personal stuff where I talk mostly about uh, comics, video games. You can also follow me at Poison Touch Pod to see my other podcast, The Poison Touch Advice Hour, where Gay and his friends give you all the best and worst advice to deal with all of life's predicaments. Also, if you are a fan of Japanese RPGs, I am starting my 365 days of Persona 3, where I'll be playing one day every single day. So if you want to see me pretend to be a Japanese high schooler, Check that out. <laughs> and we will catch you in, what do we say, Mario? Like a month or two? We're going to do season one. Taking a little give bit of like a, a month little, or two. little hiatus. Give us a month or two. Let me catch up on some Poison Touch episodes. And we'll be back talking about all things season one. Bye.